Have you ever wondered where we get the word January from? The ancient Romans called this month Januarius, named after the god Janus, or Janus. Janus is one of Rome's rare gods that did not have a Greek counterpart. He presided over doorways, thresholds, and beginnings and endings, like the new year, the beginning of the new year, which is why he's honored in the month Januarius. But where did this god come from? When did the Romans celebrate the new year in the first place, and how was Janus involved in the observance? Today we are talking all about the two-faced god and ringing in the new year Roman style. Welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. my name is Kate, and today we are discussing the Roman New Year. But when did Rome celebrate the New Year? Was it the same as ours? Was it different? The answer is a little bit complicated. You see, Rome didn't have the same calendar that we have today. Our calendar comes from the 1500s, when Pope Gregory oversaw the adjustment of the previously used calendar in Europe that was called the Julian calendar. Now that one is Roman. By the name you can probably guess, it was overseen by Julius Caesar, who had experts from Alexandria do all of the proper calculations to make sure that the year lined up with the seasons and with the solar cycle, generally speaking. We don't know too much about Rome's calendar before that, but Ovid tells us that the first emperor, Romulus, created a calendar that had 10 months in it, beginning with the month named after the god Mars, in other words, March. So Rome's new year originally was in March. The next king, Numa, added two more months, including Januarius, which is our January, again named after the god Janus. The new year was still in March, though. It was celebrated on March 15th, otherwise known as the Ides of March. Not an important date for any other reason whatsoever. And because of this, consuls who had a one-year term began their service or their time in office on March 15th. Now that's on the civic and administrative side of things. There's also a religious element to March 15th being the first day of the year. March 15th was also the day that Anna Perenna was celebrated. Now, according to mythology, and we get this also from Ovid, incidentally, all of the good stuff comes from Ovid, Anna Perenna was allegedly the sister of Dido. If you read Virgil's Aeneid, Dido is talking to her sister Anna. Allegedly, this is the same Anna. Now, after Carthage falls, she flees and runs into the Trojan refugees in Italy again, they have a big old argument because, well, you know. Um, so Anna runs away and I, th I think like she gets turned into a nymph or something. Now I'm not really remembering. Something happens, I think she gets turned into a nymph. And anyway, this is all commemorated on March 15th. Now her name, Anna Perenna, is the feminine form of what could be translated as the eternal year or the years that are always happening, basically, the, the perennial year. And so obviously you can see the connection between her name and the new year. So the Romans used to mark time by who was consul for the year. Uh, there were two consuls and they had a one year post. So it was very convenient to say, oh, this was the year that these two people were consuls together. It made it very easy, at least within, you know, a generation or so to remember exactly what year you were talking about. And it was even more convenient because the consuls took office on the first of the year, so it was a very clean and even precise way of, of keeping time. But in 153, that changed. Rome was engaged in a conflict with Hispania, and so out of necessity, the consuls for that year who had been elected you know, previously, began their term of office actually 
earlier than they were supposed to. So in other words, not on March 15th, but on January 1st. Now this doesn't mean that the new year was automatically pushed back. It actually took a long time for that to happen. The new year was officially made January 1st during Julius Caesar's calendar reforms some hundred years after the fact. But this is how the Romans ended up with the new year on January 1st. And one more point to make about this in, say it with me, Ovid's Fasti, we get yet another explanation for why this is the case. Ovid sets up a scene in the beginning of book one where he is talking to the god Janus and asking him questions about the new year and Janus is answering these questions. So Ovid asks, and I'll, I'll read a little bit here, he asks Janus, come, tell me, why does the new year begin in the cold when it ought to start in the spring? Then everything is in bloom. Then is the new age of time and new buds burst forth from fertile branches. Trees are covered by newly formed fronds and grass springs from seeds in the topsoil. Birds sweeten the mild air with their song and the flocks play and frolic in the meadows. Then the sun's rays are pleasant and unseen the swallow builds a clay nest under the raised rafters. Then the land is cultivated and restored by the plow. This would rightly be called the new year. The god Janus answers with this explanation. He says that the new year corresponds to the solar new year. So at midwinter, in other words, the winter solstice or Yule, which in our calendar is December 21st, theirs it would have been a few days after the fact, that is the time when the sun is reborn in a sense. It comes into its new cycle of growing. So the solstice is the shortest day of the year because the sun is hidden away for the longest, but then after that, the days grow longer and the sun has more of a presence in our lives. So Janus says that's the reason why January 1st is the new year because it corresponds to the new beginning of the sun cycle. So after time, the Roman New Year ended up being the beginning of the month that honors the god of new beginnings, the god Janus. And as I said, Janus is one of those Roman gods, and you don't see them too often, but a Roman god who does not have a Greek equivalent. And this is because he's probably a native Italic god of some kind. It's possible that he came from Etruria. There is a god called Kulsans, I'm absolutely pronouncing that wrong, who had similar aspects to Janus, who was depicted very similarly in artwork. It's also possible that it went the other way, that the Etruscans got the god from Janus, but that is impossible for us to tell, at least it's impossible for me to tell. Now, I wanna look at an image of Janus together and see what we can tell from this image. So here's the god Janus, and right away, something is interesting about him. He has two faces. He has one face in the front, I guess, even though we're looking at it from the side, and one face in the back. So he can see in front of him and behind him. And this is because Janus is a god of liminality in two dimensions. He governs doorways, and this is domestic doorways, so the, the front door of your house, and public doorways, so for example, the front door of the Senate House. He's in charge of gates for the same reason, and he's also in charge of liminality in terms of time. He's a temporal god. He's the god of beginnings, endings, transitions, marking the passing of time. And because of this, right, this is why he's the god of the new year. He can look back at the past year and he's also looking forward to the year to come. Now, I say he's a god of liminality in two dimensions. What I mean by that is there's two different directions that he can look, forward and backward, in and out, up and down. And we can compare this to other gods with multiple faces, like Hecate, who in Rome was called Trivia. They're very similar. Now, she has three heads, as you can see, and this is because she guards the triple crossroads and she has a triple aspect. There's all sorts of things associated with the number three going on here. But basically, she is liminality in multidimensional space, three-dimensional or, or, you know, more than that. She governs the crossroads, which were not always just two roads perpendicular to each other, 
but they could even connect three or more different roads, so she needs more than two faces. But Janus is much more linear in his liminality, you could say. Now, another thing about this image of Janus is that he is a fully grown man with a beard, or I guess you could say two beards. And this is different from the Etruscan god Kulsans, who is depicted as a youth. The depiction of a fully grown man with a beard, which was the, the mark of age and wisdom and all of that in antiquity, this signifies power and authority. Just like the Emperor card in the tarot, you can see he's got a beard here as well and he's an older man. Just like this card, Janus represents the archetype of a powerful and authoritative man who has accomplished things in his life and he's in a leadership role, hence the Emperor. And Janus was, in fact, originally associated with leadership, as we'll see when we get into some of his foundational mythology. Now, we don't really know where Janus came from, but like I said, it's possible that he's a native Italic god. I did see a theory that he may have come to Italy and Rome, by extension, from travelers, merchants, traders, who were coming by ship, bringing mythology from elsewhere, because he's not the only two-faced deity. He and Kulsans are not the only two-faced deities in the world. There are other ancient gods with this particular depiction. So it's possible that he was brought from far away, farther than Greece, because Greece does not have this kind of two-faced god, by people who were coming in on ships. So hold on to the, the ship thing for a minute here. Now, as for where Janus himself came from in a mythological context, he's considered to be a primordial deity. So he's not really associated in myth with other gods the way that we're used to seeing in Greco-Roman mythology. So Zeus and Hera are married and they have a bunch of children and Zeus has a bunch of children because he slept with a bunch of other people and it's a whole thing. Janus doesn't really have any of that. In Ovid's conversation with Janus in Book One of the Fasti, Janus explains that in the beginning there was chaos and he was a formless mass and then as the universe was formulating, he turned into this humanoid anthropomorphic figure with two faces. Um, so he was just sort of born with the universe. Right? And, you know, he's, he's a god of time, he's a god of transition, right? These are primordial concepts. And he says that after he was born, he lived in the place that is now Rome, back when it was an uninhabited forest. He said that he made his home on the hill that the Romans now call the Janiculum or Janiculum. And he says that the hill was named after him. Now, legend says that he was the first king of Latium, so before the Romans even came to Italy, he was in charge of a group of people, a settled group of people. Um, so again, leadership, right? He is associated with power and authority. While he was ruling Latium, the god Saturn was kicked out of heaven by his son Jupiter, so this is Zeus for all of the Hellenists, and Saturn fled to Italy and arrived in Latium where Janus was king by boat. Another boat thing here. Janus received him warmly, gave him shelter, took him in, and then they reigned together for some time. This makes sense because they're both temporal gods. If you missed my Saturnalia video from last time, I will link it right... I think it's... is it here? Or is it... somewhere up here. I'm, I'm new to all of this if you can't tell. But there will be something where you can see the Saturnalia video where I talk about Saturn as a god of time. Janus is also a god of time, so these guys go hand in hand. Now, as a god of beginnings and endings, particularly beginnings in this case, Janus is invoked at the beginning of activities and endeavors that you're about to set out on, and in particular at the beginning of prayers. Now, even if the prayer is not addressed to Janus specifically, he's still included as part of like the opening remarks of prayers. This is supposedly because Janus guards the boundary, the liminal space between Earth 
and heaven, the heavens where the gods live. So if you want to talk to a god, you have to go through Janus. So that's why he's invoked at the beginning of prayers. I always relate this to, I grew up Catholic and at the start of a prayer you make the sign of the cross and you say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I gather that it's something similar to that, um, although that's just personal anecdote and speculation on my part. Now, Janus's jurisdiction goes beyond the liminality of time, the beginnings and endings and the space in between. He's also, as I said, the god of liminal spaces if we're thinking about physical space. So, like I said, he is in charge of doorways, he guards doorways, he guards thresholds of any kind, um, boundary markers, crossings, and this is emphasized by two of his epithets. On the one hand, he is called patulkius, which comes from the verb pateo, meaning to open. So as patulkius, he is the one who opens, the opener. And his other epithet is clusius, which comes from the verb cluto and means to close. So clusius is the one who closes, the closer. So he is Patulkius and Clusius because he governs both of these functions of doorways and thresholds and gates. Now he wasn't just in charge of private gates like your garden gate, he was also in charge of public gates. And specifically his temple had gates. And these gates had a military significance. When the gates were opened, that meant that Rome was at war. And when the gates were closed, that meant that Rome was at peace. Now there were a few times in history, in Roman history, when the gates were closed. This was a big deal and the emperors who oversaw the closing made a big deal out of it. So it was closed three times during Augustus's reign and once during Nero's and as you can see, I'm going to put up a coin, you can see this is from the time of Nero and it depicts the temple of Janus with its gates closed. Now the inscription is a little hard to read, I'll type it out on the screen here, and this translates roughly to in peace on land and sea, he, meaning the Emperor Nero, closed the gates of Janus. You can see that word at the end of the inscription, clusit, that comes from the same verb that we get the epithet clusius from. And you might be thinking to yourself, why would you open the gates during war and close them during peace? And Ovid wondered the same thing, so he asked the god himself. And Janus replied that the reason that the doors are open during war and closed during peace is that because when you have peace, you want to keep it inside, you want to keep it with you, make sure it can't escape, right? Because peace can be a little bit elusive, but when you open the gates, that means that when your soldiers go out to war, there will be an open path for them to come home. So this is the explanation given at the beginning of the Fasti, and I like it. I think it's neat. <laughs> I think it makes sense. Um, let me know what you guys think about that. I think that's pretty cool. So in a sense, Janus is a protector god. He protects your front door. He protects the front door of temples, including and especially his own and he protects Rome generally from war, right? He keeps peace in by keeping his temple doors closed. There is a story from early mythology when he actually did protect Rome by creating a boundary. What happened was the Sabines were attacking Rome. The Sabines are like a neighboring Italian people. They attacked Rome and the god Janus, so the story goes, poured in boiling water like as a, as a barrier, like a moat almost around the city, and so the Sabines couldn't pass through the boiling water, and so they gave up and went home. So this boundary function is taken very seriously as a protective thing. So if you are trying to classify Janus, which I don't recommend, um, but if you were, you could call him a protector god. Generally speaking though, the best way to think about him is, as I said, a god of two-dimensional liminality, and that is both spatial and temporal. And that's why he's a god of the new year. It is a liminal time, even though, you know, it may be arbitrary to some degree, humans decided that this was gonna be the day, 
Um, it, it is a time of transition. It is a time of space between something ending and something beginning again, right? Especially New Year's Eve. Everything is coming to a close and then you can anticipate, you can look back on the last year and look ahead to what is coming in the next year. So how did the Romans mark the new year? What did they do to celebrate? Well, our friend Ovid, as always, has us covered. He describes a general buzz of excitement in the air during this time. He said all of the hearth fires are lit. Ovid says that this is a time when you should speak positively and focus on the good and wish others well. He reports that the god told him that beginnings matter and omens and auspices matter. So at the start of something, you want to have a positive outlook and you want to focus on the positive and speak the positive into existence because otherwise, you know, the omens are going to be wrong. You know, if you're walking into something with all of this negativity around it, it's not going to work out well. So at the beginning of the year, you want to start the year off on the right foot by being happy and positive and generous in your words. So I thought that that was something that was really important and interesting to include here because it's, I mean, it makes sense and I think we should all do the same. <laughs> now the consuls for the year began their work on this day. And so Ovid describes people flooding the streets wearing brightly colored clothing and cheering on the new consuls as they process towards the Senate House. At least that's where I assume they're going. He doesn't actually say that. And a sacrifice of cattle is offered. Ovid also reports gift giving as a part of the New Year celebration. Dates, figs, and honey were the primary gifts that were given. And when he asks Janus about this, Janus says that that's because you want to have a sweet year ahead of you. You want goodness and sweetness to come to you and those around you, so you give a gift of honey or figs or dates or something in order to say, I hope you have a sweet new year. So this is just like the speaking positive thing. It's all about setting the tone for the year, getting off on the right foot. So I hope that you all have your share of sweetness this new year. I hope that good things are coming to all of us. And I hope you enjoy this transitional time in our calendar, the weird space between Saturnalia and the solstice and New Year's. It's kind of a liminal time in and of itself. So I hope that you are enjoying this time and I wish you a wonderful 2023. Thanks as always for watching. I really appreciate you and I will see you in the next video.